Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for your patience as we got uh, set for tonight's program. I'm pretty sure you're going to agree that it's worth the wait. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm joined here by my neighbor and um, colleague, Amy Huffnagel. Would you introduce Hi. yourself? Yeah. I'm, I'm Amy Huffnagel. I'm the Director of Programs and Visitor Experience and also the Interim Executive Director of the Stowe Center. Um, so wonderful to be working with you all tonight. We're thrilled to have you. And this is one in a series of partnerships uh, between the Mark Twain House and our neighbors, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, which if you've been to visit us, you know that we are right across the lawn from one another. And in these virtual times, we've been trying to maintain that across the lawn neighbors um, relationship. We are also sharing this evening with our friends uh, at the Amistad Center for Art and Culture at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, also in Hartford, and represented tonight by Kimberly Kersey, the executive director there, who will be moderating for us. So I'm going to do some more uh, introductions in a few moments. I just would like to run through some housekeeping matters before we uh, move on. Um, first of all, you all are chatty tonight. I see you've discovered the chat. That's awesome. Uh, and thank you to our, our colleague Jacques Lamar for being there and um, rallying the troops, as it were, um, keeping you all chatted up. Um, please keep doing that throughout the program. That's fun. However, if you have a question for the Q&A section that will come toward the end of our program tonight, rather than put it in the chat where we might miss it, could I ask you please to put it in the ask a question area at the bottom of the screen right there in the middle. And a fun thing about the ask a question function is that you can check what other people have asked. And if you have the same question, you can just upvote it and that um, moves it to the top of the pile. And um, that kind of helps make the, the Q&A session go even that much smoother. So please uh, keep your eye on that. Uh, also in the chat is a very important link by which you can purchase your own signed copy of Wake. Uh, and you're going to want to do that. So we're not dummies. We know that you can purchase this book elsewhere. But if you do purchase it through that link, know that you do get a signed copy, first of all. And also know that your purchase um, benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum. And uh, that's a, a big help to us in these times that we may be coming out of the COVID era, but we're still struggling, aren't we, Amy, as museums we're and other uh, nonprofit cultural organizations um, really uh, have, have weathered a storm um, and we appreciate any support you can offer. So um, if you can support us by purchasing this book, which did you know, I know Amy, you know, this is the first uh, US virtual um, book tour event for Wake. So we are at the um, uh, place of honor, and we're very thrilled to, to be hosting our guests tonight to talk about this book. Uh, just another moment to talk about um, donations, and there's a big green button uh, beneath our faces uh, pointing out that your donation tonight will be shared equally by the Amistad Center for Art and Culture and the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. So please, as their uh, friend and colleague, I encourage you to uh, give what you can and, and support our, our fellow organizations. So Amy, um, are you going to stick with me for a moment while I show this video and then we'll introduce our guests? That sounds great. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and um, we're in for a real treat this evening. Thank you. All right. Okay. I am a historian, a granddaughter of slaves, and I am haunted. For hundreds of years, our ancestors were brutally silenced. I wasn't supposed to find their voices. Sometimes when you're hunting down the past, the past is hunting you. Women warriors led revolts on slave ships and fought their enslavers in the Americas, and then they were erased from history. Wake uncovers this history. I was born to tell this story. I had no idea that uncovering their stories would be its own fight. Wake is a powerful reminder that while the past is gone, we still live in its wake. Wow, huh? <laughs> 
So with no further ado, I know if you weren't already eager to hear our speakers talk, um, I'm going to introduce our speakers. And Amy, I'm going to um, keep you on just long enough to say hi to everybody. So um, we're thrilled and honored to be here tonight. As I said, this is the first U.S. stop uh, on the virtual book tour for Wake, which was published just yesterday. Um, the book is getting amazing reviews with comments such as this from WNPR, or NPR, I should say. WNPR is our local affiliate. Paul's eloquence and frank emotionalism are transcendentally realized in Martinez's art beckoning the reader inexorably into this story, even the parts that only take place inside Hall's mind, with its remarkable blend of passion and fact, action and reflection, Wake sets a new standard for illustrating history. So our uh, guests tonight are the author of Wake, Dr. Rebecca Hall, who's a scholar, activist, and educator after graduating from Berkeley Law in 1989, she represented low-income tenants and homeless families for eight years before returning to get her PhD in history. She's taught at UC Santa Cruz, Berkeley Law, Berkeley's History Department, and as a visiting professor of law at the University of Utah. She writes and publishes on the history of race, gender, law, and resistance, as well as articles on climate justice and intersectional feminist theory. Rebecca has been an activist her entire life, fighting for women's and LGBT rights and against nuclear weapons, apartheid, and U.S. militarism. She's dedicated to the movement for climate justice and is also currently involved with Black Lives Matter and rapid response support for families facing deportation. Hugo Martinez, our illustrator, is an independent comic artist focused on depicting narratives of struggle, identity, and resilience. He's based in New Orleans. And joining them is our moderator tonight, our great friend and colleague, Kimberly Kersey, who's executive director of the Amistad Center for Art and Culture at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, of, excuse me, at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art here in Hartford. So please join me in welcoming our guests as I bring them onto the screen, which can take just a moment. So forgive me for the delay. And... Are we all here? I believe so. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing this special evening with us. Thank you. And thank you so much for the introductions, Jennifer. And thank you, Amy. Same. It's a pleasure to be in partnership with you all. And of course, to be celebrating amazing history that is both researched so profoundly and illustrated so profoundly. Wonderful. So. Let's, let's take it away. And um, Amy and I are going to sit back and enjoy. And Kimberly, yeah. you'll let me know when it's time to do Q&A. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Well, welcome in Dr. Rebecca Hall and Hugo Martinez. Um, thank you for spending time with us tonight. Um, this book is really like none other that, that I've personally read before. The story of uh, a historian gathering history, really sharing what it feels like during the process of a large scale research project and then combining that with your findings. It's truly a unique experience, a unique perspective. Yeah. So doc, Dr. Hall, I'm fascinated by your professional pivot from, from practicing attorney to historian to published author. Can you walk us through that progression? Uh, yeah, I can, I can try. <laughs> um, uh, so, I, uh, I was an attorney. I did. Uh, I worked with long-term tenants and also homeless families, um, and I uh, did that for about eight years. And um, I completely burned out on um, doing that. Um, a big part of the reason why was the way that racism and sexism, or what I call racialized gender, seemed to be baked in to um, the, the litigation process. Uh, both in terms of, of um, you know, obtaining money damages for my uh, black women um, plaintiffs. You know, I would have black women and white women have the, you know, in the same laws, have the same facts. And, you know, black women would be getting like half uh, what the white women were getting. Um, and uh, also, I got very tired of, of walking into courtrooms and um, 
the being a weapon, people are just assuming I'm some a, the criminal defendant and having to say over and over again, you know, like I am attorney for the plaintiff, you know. So, um, and I felt like in order to understand what was going on, um, I needed to continue the study of history. I got my BA in history. I've always loved history. Um, and so I went back to school for another seven years. <laughs> I still have student loans. Um, that uh, to to get the to get my PhD. And and this uh, graphic novel is is based on my on my dissertation and um, on a couple of subsequent academic articles that that I published. But it was really important for me to be able to get this research out into the public, into the main, mainstream, because, um, you know, work that's published in academic circles, I mean, you know, maybe like 10 history graduate students might have read, you know, uh, an article that I wrote. And um, so this was an opportunity to get to, you know, to get this information out. And I think it's really uh, crucial, crucial information. Yeah. Well, thank you for your research, and I can't wait to dive a little bit deeper into, into your findings. Um, Hugo Martinez, what readied you artistically to take on this project? Um, I, it's hard to say. There's a lot that, that, uh, that, that kind of came before the project actually started, and you know, part of it was spending time with Dr. Hall. Um, you know, I got to spend a little bit of time with, with Dr. Hall in Utah. Um, in her home and, and just kind of working out the, the promotional piece that we sent out to publishers. And, and then there was time in, in New York where we went around the city uh, as Dr. Hall continued to do research and, um, and, and, and just, um, yeah, it, it's part of it was experiencing New York with, with her. And, um, and then, um, you know, there was, there was about a year of visual research that, that, went into into this where you know there were all these locations as you already saw where you know it takes place in New York 18th century New York uh, it takes place in you know in uh, California and Nebraska during um, the Great Migration a little bit in Chicago I guess uh, and um, the kingdom of the Dahomey Kingdom in the 18th century um, took place on 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 ships of the 18th century, and all of those things were were a lot to kind of immerse uh, in visually in order to 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 understand and and to and to get a just a contextual understanding of of what of where we were going to be in this book. Exactly. Um, I, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I thought, well, what I need to do is learn. I mean, I've only ever written academically before. It's like, okay, I need to learn how to write a script for a graphic novel, but I thought, oh, the research is done. But when I did all that research, I wasn't doing anything visual. Like, I wasn't doing any visual research. So, yeah, we, we, you know, we had to, you know, Hugo and I had to really, really um, do a lot of visual research, and we were very, very careful, you know, to make sure that it was as accurate as possible and i just didn't want people coming for us because we had like the wrong tree you know <laughs> in 1712 in, in new york or, yeah. yeah and and you know it's a really you know it's a period of history where you you know you have colonial britain kind of with with like dutch uh dutch new york uh you know kind of interacting and and you know you, it, you know, I, I, I was struggling for a while just trying to like, you know, where are we? <laughs> All the images were of like British New York or or Dutch New York, and they're those are two quite different places. Um, and and yeah, that was that was a lot of, of of the work that you know we had to kind of like go back and forth and say like, you know, hey Rebecca, like, is this the place? <laughs> <laughs> now, Dr. Hall, you mentioned that the research for this book was part of your dissertation. Mm -hmm. Just how long did it take you to research all that you needed to look into for this book? Um, well, the, 
the re research and writing of the <clears throat> dissertation took four years. The, the history PhD uh, took about seven years. It's, it's, it, it's one of the longer PhD programs because you, you have to master a, a large body of, of literature before you even begin, begin your, own, your own research. Uh, yeah. So let me ask you this particularly about the book. So the word wake takes on a whole host of different definitions. What considerations did you have when you were titling the book? Well, um, yeah, I mean, wake has multiple uh, valences. And, that, and um, in the book, uh, you know, wake is, you know, the wake of a slave ship, being in the wake of a slave ship. Uh, wake is also being in the wake of slavery, um, mm -hmm. in, you know, in slavery's af aftermath currently today. Uh, wake is also uh, what you do, a ceremony to, to honor the dead. And um, the book focuses on, on all of those, all of those valences. Interesting. So at what point in your research did you did you see a book taking shape? I mean, this was part of a dissertation. At what point did it did it pivot and become the idea for a book? Oh, like fifteen years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no, I, I, there's no way that, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I thought, but so I finished in two thousand. I got my PhD in two thousand four, um, and. Uh, I started conceptualizing this as a graphic novel mm -hmm. in about 2017. And I had to learn, um, there's a lot of methodology to that, to that medium. Um, and so I, I needed to learn quite, quite a lot about graphic novels and what can be done in that medium. And, uh, and then, you know, we got seriously started in, uh, 2018, um, and that's when I connected with Hugo, and we created, you know, the first eight pages and started a Kickstarter campaign, and uh, it just blew up from there. And I, I had no idea there would be this kind of level of interest. I, I, I thought, you know, this is my passion project, um, but yeah, it just exploded in a way so that, that I was not expecting. So how did you know from the get-go that it was going to be a graphic novel? That's such a unique way to tell the story. Uh, well, um, I, I love graphic novels. I've, I've read them, a lot of them. I uh, was particularly inspired by Art Spiegelman's Mouse, um, which talks about him, his experience of being a child of, of a Holocaust survivor. Um, the, the first volume is called My Father Bleeds History. Um, I was inspired by uh, Persepolis. Uh, when when March, March, the three volume book March that tells the life, the story of John Lewis, uh, uh, we were already working on, on the graphic novel with, with, when that came out. Um, and what I learned is that um, this was a perfect story for this medium. This medium can do something that other mediums can't do. You, you've got this kind of text, which is linear, right? You read the text, and then you have art, which is which is an all of at once experience. And the graphic medium intertwines these these things. And what it does is it allows it allowed me to tell a story, which allowed us to tell a story that takes place in the past. Um, you know, in the 18th century, and then tell the story of the research process, and also tell the story of, you know, my grandmother's life, um, and tell the story of living in the afterlife or the wake of slavery. So having all those temporal uh, elements linked to each other, uh, you know, it, I just couldn't conceive of how that would happen in a regular, a regular book. And I think people who aren't familiar with graphic novels uh, kind of see this as, you know, see can see this medium as kind of like a, a dumbing down of the material. 
Um, uh, and it really is not. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's actually quite, quite sophisticated. Um, yeah. Hugo, what was your initial reaction to the story when you were presented with it? Uh, it was, uh, I was honestly uh, taken aback. Um, I was just like, <laughs> my, my friend Kate, who's a mutual friend with uh, Rebecca is, is, is who I found out about this through. And, um, and she sent me a text and or not a text, but like some, like a message somehow. And I, you know, I've been doing little you know, illustrations here and, and she sent me this thing about a graphic novel. And I was like, I, I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but then I, I read through what was going on, you know, what the story was. And I was like, you know, this is what really matters. These stories of resistance, these stories that um, say, you know, that there is more history than what we are taught. Um, I, I was excited to, to participate in that um, and to, to, you know, uh, depict something that, that can be so transformative uh, to people's hearts and minds. Did you immediately see a vision for how you might illustrate it? Was it was it clear to you from the outset? Uh, no, I, I think, you know, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, it, it, it was, you know, any, it, it's, I feel like the process is, is, I think there are some artists that, you know, are able to you know, just have this whole vision in their head and then they, they lay it out. Um, this this is a much more complicated process than that. Um, in that, you know, we had you know our scripts were, you know, we were working simultaneously. I, I was you know, Rebecca was writing while I was illustrating, and and it was all kind of piecemeal. Where you know, you know, I was Rebecca was like finished the prologue in chapter one, and I started doing that, and then and then she would do like chapter five. And then, and then I would start doing that, and and I, it, it was kind of, you know, I wasn't illustrating it in 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 its completed sense, but yeah. I was doing storyboards, and and then when we put all that together, you know, like kind of jumping back and forth, we had to kind of work together to string it together, and and yeah. you know, um, there are plenty of times when, you know, I was struggling with how to depict something in the story, and. Um, and you know we we kind of like there was there was one that I think we redid like five times, um, <laughs> and and it and it ended up working really beautifully I think, um, and but it, but it wasn't you know it wasn't just like poof inspiration and there and there it is you know there's a lot of like you know dialogue that that has to take place. Yeah, I mean the the um, the process of creating these images. Um, were was yeah like Hugo says it was a real kind of back and forth process you know where he would show me sketches and pencils and he's like is this what you're going for you know and if it wasn't working you know it's like that's not it um, or I would approach him and be like I don't know how to visualize this um, you know and he would have suggestions so we you know we worked together through through the whole process. The, the graphic illustrations, they just, they convey emotions so well. I mean, you can sense the despair and the frustration and just like the moodiness on, on the different pages of the book. Um, I almost feel as if they're showing, you know, Dr. Hall, Rebecca, your, your inner thoughts as you're going through this process. Was that important to you that the final project um, show both the words that you've written, but also the inner dialogue that was happening as you were going through it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, I think, you know, history is taught really poorly in this country. Um, and I've, uh, you know, had the kind of weird experience of teaching law school, graduate school, undergrad and high school. And I've seen how poorly history is taught. And um, I think a lot of people don't really understand what historians do, like what our craft is. Um, and um, also a big part of the story w was the process of uncovering the story and the obstacles, uh, 
you know, that I encountered in uncovering the story. Um, I feel like that that is, you know, is is really important too. In addition to to the story, that the stories of women are involved, you know, as well. You talk a lot in the book, well, you talk some in the book about the primary sources, the primary historic documents that you referenced in gathering your facts. Can you share a little bit about those? Because they were so, in and of themselves, they were just interesting to learn about and hear about in the context of slavery. Share with the viewers some of the things you specifically looked at in the course of your research. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're, so, eight, so early 1700s, writing about enslaved women uh, is extremely difficult uh, because none of the sources that are created, uh, first of all, there are not a lot of sources that are created, but none of them that are created are at all designed to, to talk to understand the inter interiority of enslaved women, you know? So it involved reading a, a lot of sources just kind of against the grain in order to try to tease out um, these women's stories. So the, the sources were everything from, you know, court documents rela related to the prosecution of enslaved people uh, who had participated in revolt to um, captain ships, logs and insurance policies and correspondence between, you know, the colonial governors of New York and, you know, the Queen's Privy Council and, um, you know, the regulations and practices of the Royal African Company. I think a lot of people don't understand that this was a, very, a big business and it was uh, very heavily regulated. Um, and so those, those documents. Um, and then also, um, the um, African burial grounds here here in New York, uh, there were studies done at Howard University with uh, uh, over like 400 skeletons that had been excavated. And, you know, these, um, these anthro paleontologists, I think that's what they call them, sir, were, were able to like look at things like women's, you know, skeletons and be able to tell like what kind of work they were engaged in. Hmm. Um, and uh, how difficult, you know, that work was. Uh, you know, people are not very familiar with urban slavery, uh, which existed, you know, both north and south, and they're not not familiar with with northern slavery. Hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's that's the, that's some of the sources that I use, and I think, you know, the. So the captain's logs, which I which I um, read in in England when I was doing research there for the dissertation, uh, you know these logs are very detailed, and they're detailed because um, they're documents for the people who own the ships and own the the, the quote cargo, but also um, slave slave ships revolt revolt were reported and documented because. There was insurance um, that could be that was paid out for what what the insurance companies like Lloyd's of London, you know, called there was a, a provision in the policy called the insurrection of cargo, you know, which just blew me away. I mean, cargo doesn't insurrect, right? I mean, the, the contradiction is built into that, you know, into that phrase. So it was a lot of it was. And it was difficult, and I and I really wanted Hugo to to convey like how it was emotionally difficult as well. Well, one of the things that I forgot until I was reading the book is that slavery was legal, and you mentioned that it was really heavily regulated, that it was insured, and it really was big business. Yeah. And I loved this. I love that you shared in the book your story of traveling to Lloyd's of London and how you were greeted and received there. <laughs> But it really just underscores that this is this was serious business. There's a lot of money to be made, and it was heavily regulated. And there was nothing um, quiet or impermissible about it. It was perfectly legal. Well, yeah, and you know, I study British America. When you you know when you get a PhD in history, you have to specialize. And I was interested in this early period because 
that's really when chattel slavery is, is, is becoming instantiated. And, and um, I wanted to sort of go back to the original instantiation of that. But, but um, you know, the British slave trade, um, you know, occurred, you know, through the 18th century, through the 1700s. And um, even though the slave trade was a 400 year uh, process, um, the over 80% of the trade happened when England was in charge of the trade. And if you look at English history or, you know, British history, or, you know, what we, what we're told is that the role that Great Britain had in the slave trade was abolishing it. Um, and we're not told this other story about, yeah, well, first they seriously profited and conducted this trade and you know that all that capital and resources were used in the process of industrializing that country and and bringing it into it you know into its wealth in the book you talk about a measured use of historic imagination i love that phrase mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about what that means yeah so there were a couple of times in the book uh, like a chapter and a half <laughs> where, you know, the record is just falls silent. Um, there's just, there's no documentation. Um, and I wanted to try to figure out uh, if I could try to imagine what these stories could have been, but, but this, the measured use of historical imagination, everything in that, that chapter and a half is completely grounded in historical research. There's not one part of it that's, you know, I mean, the the lives of the characters, you know, like in New York, the the four women in, involved in the revolt, you know, like who owned them, what kind of work they did, uh, all of that is is, you know, is is true. Um, you know the oathing ceremony that that takes pl took place. Um, that that's that's true, and I did a lot of research on oathing ceremonies before revolts uh, in British colonies that were dominated by the Afghan diaspora at like New York is, which is current Ghana, um, and you know so so there was very little that that was not that came out of actual, my actual imagination. You know, it was more kind of putting pieces together. I guess along those lines, I was really taken by your finding that the more women that were on a slave ship, the more likely there was to be a revolt. And I had to stop and think about that for a minute and what, what, the, what those inferences were. Um, that's an amazing fact to find. Well, yeah, and I, I have to point out that that fact is not something I found. Um, you know, there are quantitative historians, uh, which I don't do quantitative history because I can't add, but there were quantitative historians who, um, you know, created this massive data database, the transatlantic slave trade database, which is online and people can use it, uh, where, um, where historians who studied the slave trade pooled all of their records and, and documented 35,000 slave ship voyages and and made it searchable and one of the things that they found was there was a revolt on one in ten ships which is much more than anybody expected uh because you know revolt revolts on slave ships are you know usually suicide um and and the other thing they found was that the more women there were on a ship so they looked at the ships that had revolts and the ships that didn't have revolts. And they were like, well, what's the difference? And the big difference was the more women on a ship, the more likely there would be a revolt. But these historians dismissed this because they said, you know, we know that, you know, uh, women of African descent or enslaved women didn't participate in, uh, you know, organized violent resistance like, like revolts. You know, and I, I took that as like a call to action. And, you know, I spent a long time looking through um, captain's logs and trying to understand, you know, how these revolts happened. 
you know, and it, it, and it became very clear why that was. I mean, it was really kind of logistical because once a ship left the African coast, you know, before it left the coast, every all the captives changed underneath the deck, you know, below deck. But once the ship left the African coast, um, the, the women were brought on deck. And this was a policy of, you know, I mean, it's like literally written in the regulations. This is how you conduct a slave ship. Um, and, you know, they were roaming free on deck where, like, the weapons are kept. <laughs> and, um, you know, and some of these slave ship captains um, couldn't see women's involvement, and they were very confused. Like, there was another revolt today, and we checked the men's chains, and they were all secure. Uh, some of them were were very clear that the women instigated it. Um, so, yeah. So looking at the qualitative sources themselves is what let me understand that finding. So I guess it, it ties into, I think, your, your bigger um, uh, conversations and research around this conspiracy of silence, right? The, um, the, the silence of uh, women warriors in general, not just with respect to slave the slave trade, um, but across um, gender lines in general. I mean, yeah, I mean, women lawyers, you know, across cultures, it's, a, you know, that's a whole nother topic, <laughs> you know, we can talk about. Um, but, I, I, you know, in terms of enslaved women, I, I, I don't want, it, it wasn't like a conspiracy. You know, it's not like all these historians got in a room and said, let's uh, throw out any source that mentions women and then write in our books how women weren't involved. I mean, history's always written in a, in a context, in a social context. And when, when uh, slave revolts, um, when that history was being recovered for the first time, you know, in the 60s and, and early 70s, you know, by African-Americans, mainly men, you know, this was in the context of so much discourse about how gender roles among black people are dysfunctional and black women are, you know, emasculating and are matriarchal and, you know, and 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 then they were writing against that, you know, and just like in the black power movement or, you know, where there was this, you know, idea that like, well, women, you should step back, you know, let the men lead. Um, you know, it's the same in the history books, you know, where it was like, in the history books, there was this you know, statement of this, you know, that women didn't do this. Um, you know, and then, you know, in, in the next decades of feminist historians started writing, they, they, you know, they said, well, if women didn't participate in slave revolt, they were involved in all this other kind of resistance, this day-to-day -day resistance and all these things. And, and, and that's great, because that type of resistance needed to be recovered. But they didn't question the underlying assumption that women were involved in, in revolts. Um, does that make sense? So it's not like a, a conspiracy in a dark room, you know? I really appreciate that you uh, took the time to talk about I guess the genesis of the West African enslaved. I mean, it's a topic that I think sometimes can be uncomfortable for a lot of people, a lot of a lot of African Americans. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, and and this is another way in which history is really poorly taught. Um, mm -hmm. The you know the history of the slave trade, like you said, it's a very uncomfortable topic. It's it's you know for African Americans and you know you know for anybody, uh, and it's 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 usually very simplified in these two extremes. One is that like you know. Africans were kidnapped by Europeans who just came up into the into, into West Africa and like grabbed people. Or the other extreme, which is that, you know, Africans sold their brothers and sisters into slavery, you know, and neither of those things are true. And there was also a lot of change over time. I and mean, this is a 400 year process. So in the book, I try in two pages <laughs> because, um, you know, to explain how, you know, in the very beginning, 
you know, we're talking about the 1450s, you know, when the Portuguese tried the, tried the tactic of going, uh, you know, into Africa and to grab people, they, you know, they, they were immediately killed. You know, the, these, there were large nation states in, in West Africa and they were heavily armed. And, you know, people had been working iron in Africa as long as they had in Europe. And the European weaponry was, was horrible. I mean, they had these muskets that took like three minutes to fire and then if it got wet, you know, forget it. And by the time they did all that, you know, they, they'd have like 20 spears and, you know, arrows in them, you know, but as, as time changed, that, that technology changed, but, um, and in, the European technology improved and also the demand for captives just exploded as plantation economy started to develop. And it became such a huge demand that different nations were in this position where they had to trade or be traded. And, you know, the idea that people sold their brothers and sisters in, into slavery, I mean, Africa is a big place. You know, you wouldn't say that Europeans sold their brothers and sisters. You know, it's these were different nations uh, some of them that were enemies that had been at war with each other for a very long time. So, um, yeah, the history is it's complex. Hugo, near the end of the book, there's imagery of um, the uh, the Green Book travel guides, um, Black Lives Matter marches, and some of the tragedies from 2022. Was it important that your illustrations speak to some of the more modern day history that's going on as well? Well, uh, definitely. I, I think uh, this is clearly a, a conversation with the present um, that, that we're, we're showing. And, you know, um, and one of the, the guiding um, images that Rebecca and I talked about was just a, a river of resistance and, and depicting that. Um, and it was important to, to depict how that has been taking place and how this is not this, you know, that there is, you know, history and context that, that brings us to where we are in, in the present time. And, and that was important to depict, you know, tying the present to, to the past. Right, absolutely. And I have one last question that I wanted to uh, to ask you, Hugo, before we um, we open it up for questions. To, I see there's a number of questions that are um, in the chat. Was there ever, ever, ever any thought to colorize any of the images? I mean, they're striking. The, the black and white imagery is just so striking. And your use of line, um, you know, the, the thickness, the thinness, almost the woodcut quality of the images, it's very artistic. Ever any thought of colorizing some or all of the imagery? Um, I think that would have been lovely. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I think that just, uh, I guess I didn't feel like we had much say about, about like the, that part of the medium, mm -hmm. I think maybe because yeah. of this, but I, I, I can't remember that. Part yeah, of the I didn't want color. I didn't want yeah. color. I felt like black and white is much more, much more powerful. Um, yeah. and then the thought of you maybe just right. adding one color or like a little bit, uh, you know, you know that became sort of well. This is bigger budget, you know, to do something like this. But I specifically wanted black and white. Um, it's amazing yeah. to me how much gets conveyed again with just the black and white, the weight of the line, and then just the shadowing is just incredible. So I really enjoyed the images as much as I enjoyed the story. The whole thing was just um, very impactful. Great. Jennifer, can I invite you to come back on and join us? I see there are some questions that have been asked. Indeed, you can. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. You. What a great conversation. Thank you all so much. Um, so fascinating. I can tell that our uh, audience is loving it, too. And they've posed some very good questions. Um, before I go to their questions, though, I just want to point out, Hugo, that there's somebody named Yvonne, who claims to be your sister in She's the audience. Sister. You want to say hi? Unless there's someone impersonating Yvonne, I, I'm pretty sure that's her. She, she's very proud, and I thought Aww. you should know that. So if you want to give her a shout out, now's yeah. your time. Love you, sis. Aww. Love my fam. 
Um, there are a number of questions about research, and I know that you've talked a lot about this, um, and I, I think that um, I propose this to both Hugo and to uh, Dr. Hall. Um, did you, like for instance, how much going to various sites and doing interviews with individuals, so brand new research versus turning to even primary sources or secondary sources, did you do? Um, is yeah. something we can talk about? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no interviewing people, uh, you know, when you're writing about events that occurred in the 1700s, you know, there's nobody to interview and there, and there are no, no, there's not even photographs, you know? Um, so, uh, so, you know, it's, it's all, it's all documents. Um, the story about my grandmother and her life, um, are, was based on stories that my, my father had told me um, growing up, um, but she, of course, died long before uh, I was born because she was born in 1860, you know, on a plantation in, in, in Missouri. So um, I, didn't, I didn't get the chance to, to meet her or talk to her. And how about you, Hugo, when you were, you know, conceiving of these images, were you relying just on, on Rebecca's um, words or did you do research yourself and go back and look oh, at God. documents and photos? <laughs> Remember the uh, rope, no. rope making? Uh, <laughs> how they I, rope. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, you know, at the beginning there were a lot of locations that uh, Rebecca and I talked about uh, explore or, or, or illustrating. And you know, without the script at that moment, there was no way to know like how much weight each location would carry. So I just like went head first into different things, uh, uh, and I I, I looked at uh, the rope making factory for like probably a cumulative amount of days, um, <laughs> and drew it so many different times and so many different ways, and looked at how ropes were being made and all this stuff, and. There's only one page that that is illustrated. And 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 then, uh, but there was yeah. Uh, so I think there was like some imagery that you know we gathered together when we were in New York, just of like you know these historical uh, like the the New York Historical Society, of um, of uh, just oh god. Uh, I think we just blanking on, municipal, on the we municipal, went to municipal archives, archives. We went to the African Burial Ground National yeah, Monument. Yeah. Um, you know, we walked around that really old part of Manhattan mm -hmm. um, and where there's actually still some um, things left from that period. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there was that. And then and then there was, you know, I, I would consult with like the New York Historical uh, Society just to, you know, they had a, an image of the Burgess view, which is something that um, I ended up using on the on the the case cover. Um, yeah, right that's a map. The, it's a map and, and, from like 1754. Or something. Right, and and it's this what you know was then kind of the skyline of New York City in in the in the 18th century, um, and 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 then you know there are all these like you know, artifacts that I had to go in and, you know, like try to figure out, you know, like what they look like, you know, the, looking at images of like um, New Amsterdam versus New York and, and seeing, you know, this is a period of transition where New York is, is, is becoming um, and, and New Amsterdam is, is receding um, and just kind of trying to uh, figure those things out um, and, and also, you know, looking at images of, of West African people um, to depict the characters in, in, um, in the story. Oh, yeah. Well, I know it was a lot of work, but it must, it, 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 you, you get very animated so when you're talking about yeah. it. So it must've been fun too, and it's in its way. Yeah, I, it was, it was um, yeah, wonderful to, to just be able to, to just get immersed in, a, in so many different places. And, in lives. Well, it paid off. So K Metro says, what was the most inspiring narrative or person you researched and wrote about in Wake? Well, I mean, I felt like they were all, 
that's a, a really hard question to, to, no, not fair. to, no to fair. answer. I, I think the slave ship, um, the unity, um, the captain's log uh, uh, that describes four revolts that happened, you know, on the ship um, that documented women's leadership, um, what is a really powerful source. Um, but, you know, if you look at, at, you know, they describe like woman number 10 of, of money pennies purchase, like, you know, it's like super cargo, different people would own a certain percentage of, of, of captives. So it's hard to, to, to talk about their their lives or their, their lived experience, but but to see those revolts documented um, was, was really exciting. Mm. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, there's a lot of uh, questions. This is from a, a person whose name I'm not sure I will say correctly. It's C O N A L, um, Conal, I'm going to say. Um, talking about it's a very long question, but um, what advice do both of you have for scholars who might be considering the graphic novel format as a way to express their research and stories? For scholars? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I would say go for it. Um, I think it's really important. Um, I think that academia is kind of, you know, falling apart uh, in terms of uh, everything from job opportunities to just in so many ways. And, um, and if you're passionate about something and you want people to, to, to learn about it, I think the graphic novel format is a very powerful one. Um, there are some incredible books that talk about, uh, you know, the medium and what it does. And my, I mean, my favorite is uh, Scott McCloud's uh, book, Understanding Comics. Um, you know, I would recommend, you know, people do some research, um, especially if they're not artists. They're not, you know, I mean, I'm not an artist. I can't draw a stick figure, you know. Um, but uh, you know to do you know to, to to do to learn about the medium and you know and how it works and how it can work and what you can do with it and, and so forth yeah i i agree um i, I think i want to add that like i you know people's ability to render uh maybe you know sometimes that that isn't necessarily a factor in how to com communicate visually i think um as long as you have something that you can present that can be clearly understood, um, I think you know the, the visual medium matters no matter what. Um, and and I think that there's there's just a lot of tools that that um, that can really enhance what what text can say visually and. Um, I don't know, there's something to the medium that to me that is like, that is exciting that, you know, you can manipulate space in a way that communicates, you know, many different things. It can, it can communicate time, it can communicate emotion, it can communicate, uh, I don't know, just a ton of things, but, uh, and, and, and all of that can happen on a single page, you know, um, or, you know, or various. Um, so I, I think that the the you know power of that medium is is, is something that is is uh, worth worth exploring. Yeah, and if you're a scholar and, and not an artist, find an amazing artist like Hugo. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. I just did something really wrong. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. I was trying to get back to to Kimberly. You know that we. Um, can you tell us a little bit about materials in the collection of the Amistad Center? Uh, do, do you have graphic novels or anything like this in the collection yet? Or um... We don't. Our, we have a, a very robust book collection, um, close to 300 titles, but they're all early edition, um, you know, older manuscripts, uh, nothing from current day. 
um, we do uh, acquire, um, you know, new works, and uh, certainly that could be a consideration. Um, but we don't currently have anything like that in our collection. I was kind of perusing the chat as we were um, dealing, answering these questions, and someone chatted that they would be curious to know um, more about the shackles and kind of what that feels like. Uh, we do have a set of actual slave shackles in our collection, and I can tell you it's it's um, the first time that I um, uh, saw them and held them, um, that feeling is just incredibly powerful. The weight of those shackles is, is much more than you might think it, it would be. And and have you shared that experience with, with members of the public? I'm just wondering if that feels different to a person of color than a person like myself, perhaps. Um, might. You know, one, one of the challenges, one of the things I'd like to do is, is get a reproduction of the shackles. It's, you know, it's, we, we, it'd be wonderful to be able to have folks come and feel them and hold them in their hands. Um, but unfortunately, it's, um, it's a precious item, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we can't have the public touch them. Um, but I would, like, I would love to have a reproduction of the same, you know, weight and heft so that you can experience it for yourself. That'd be, I don't want to say amazing, but that would be really interesting. It'd be powerful. Mm -hmm. It would be powerful. That's the word I wanted. Thank you, Kimberly. A number of people are uh, asking questions about sharing uh, uh, your book um, with younger students. Um, and there's uh, several questions about when the paperback edition might be coming out. And then um, Tine, I, I will say her, uh, the name Tine, uh, says, um, hi, thanks for this. What other texts would you put your book in conversation with for grades seven through nine. Wow. That's wow. A good question. Well, okay, so the first question first. I have no idea when the paperback comes out. Uh, <laughs> I would ask need to ask Simon and Schuster and I never have. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, but it is definitely our intention to have this be adopted as a textbook. Uh, for high school students, particularly, you know, in the upper grades, um, you know, it, and in addition to college students. Uh, uh, and the other question was what, what work that would be put in conversation with in grade seven through nine? Correct. Oof. Uh, I, I am sorry. I, I do not know. I mean, I honestly don't know. That's fair enough. Yeah. We'll put you on the spot. We'll put you on the spot. It, I, I would suggest, so one thing we didn't mention was that well, the Crowdcast is being recorded and folks can come back and watch it anytime they want. But one of the neat things about Crowdcast is the chat remains live so that perhaps if anybody has an idea about that, they can come back later, uh, come to our website, marktwainhouse.org and find this program and um, maybe share some ideas uh, about that because that seems like something worth, worth delving into. Can I just say, as, as I thought about it for a little bit, I just want to say that um, stories of resistance is are really important for um, for Black children. You know, when we learn about slavery, we should, in that instant, learn about how this is something that we fought every step of the way, um, because otherwise. Um, it can be really demobilizing and kind of shame, shameful. And I think the history of resistance is, is, is really um, also been kind of suppressed. Um, again, not a conspiracy, just <laughs> the environment. And, uh, and, and so, you know, from whenever you have that first talk with your child or your student, you know, um, I really would, you know, talk about this history. That feels like a really important point. Thank you for raising it. We have one more question for Hugo and one more for, for maybe both of you, and then we'll be getting close to time. And I'm sorry, I'm not getting to everybody's questions. I'm kind of skimming over ones that I feel like were addressed pretty thoroughly uh, in the conversation. For, so for those of you who posed questions that I'm not answering, that's generally the reason. Um, so, uh, Hugo, did you did working on this book alter or influence your understanding of history or your place in history at all? Can you talk at all about that? Uh, yeah, I think it definitely transformed a lot of, of 
how I understood our, our conception of, of the history of enslavement um, and, and just also how, how um, I, don't, I, I, I always kind of go back in my mind to uh, Lloyd's of London in that moment where Rebecca is in, in that archive Sorry to bring up a terrible memory, Rebecca. Uh, um, but it just um, and 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 it was just how these really um, just quotidian uh, artifacts really hold so much um, so much important and and impactful history. You know, you have records where you know you you just have something that is so day to day, but it, it in that there are all these details about, you know, everything that that is um, that is creating enslavement and, and the, everything that like continues to to feed it and, and, and perpetuate it. Um, there, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's there's a lot, um, and it's I guess I'm having trouble like just saying everything that that um, that really is impactful about about this book and, and the history that it that it conveys um i i, I think I, I think one of the things that is is that rebecca has iterated various times that already is just how we don't think about new york as or or, or you know the north of of the united states as a place where slavery happens or has slavery happened and um and that's something that um that is is just an important dialogue to continue to to engage is just how um, how all of this country has really been impacted by and, and not just the south and not just you know it's not just um, one part of the country that that holds that history it's all of our country. That was a great answer. Thank you. I'm very. Um, and I'm going to kind of conflate two questions here uh, uh, for both of you, but particularly for you, Rebecca, as you did your research and your writing. Um, did you encounter um, pushback from anybody or criticism or, or um, along the way uh, or resistance of, of, of a different kind? And if so, how, and also in, in um, dealing with these very very deeply personal and, and, and disturbing sometimes issues. How did you care for yourself? How did you summon your spirits? Did you, how, how did you handle that? Yeah. Um, in terms of pushback, I think um, the archival experience and uh, certain archives that um, made a point of denying access uh, was one kind of uh, pushback. Another kind were archives where they existed that they didn't have uh, material on the topic and that they did. Um, I think, you know, mm -hmm. even even conceptualizing what I wanted to do for a dissertation, you know, my dissertation advisor and others were saying, well, you're probably right that women were involved in this, but, you know, you're not going to find sources. Um, and uh, so it was kind of a, a, a fight. The, the whole way. And in terms of the emotional impact, it was really difficult. And I think I, I discussed that in the, it, I definitely discussed that in the book as well. Um, you know, what, you know, a lot of times our research is funded by grants, you know, you have to apply for grants. And I, you know, I got a grant from the Ford Foundation Center to go to, go to the UK to do research um, on about, you know, the slave trade. You know, and spending, but it's a limited amount of time. And, and I had a child, so I couldn't be away from home for two months. Um, but to spend every day, hours a day, reading slave ship captain's logs was just, just devastating. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if I did a great job in the self care department, but um, it, yeah, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. Imagine. Well, gosh. But I just want to say that, you know, a big part of what helped me persevere is thinking about my grandmother, you know, like, and what she went through, you know, both as a child and then through reconstruction and all the Great Migration. And it's like, if, you know, if, if she could do all that, I can research, <laughs> you know. 
good point. <laughs> so my final question um, to both of you is, have you been to Hartford, Connecticut? And will you, if not, will you please come and visit Mark Twain's house? And I know Amy would want you to come see Harriet Beecher Stowe's house. And I know Kimberly would want you to come see the collection at the Amistad Center. Um, can, can we invite you and count on you to come once you're settled down after your tour? I would love to come, actually. Yeah. I've, I've been in Hartford a, a couple of times, but it was a long time ago. But I would be fascinated to go you know, to all three of, of these locations. Uh, so yeah, it, it, invite us. <laughs> Consider yourselves invited. Um, we, we'd love to have you. And, and we're again, we're so thrilled to have you on this inaugural um, talk of your um, book tour. And um, we wish you all the luck in the world and, and um, have fun uh, as you continue to talk about your book. And you know that this is going to be aired, this talk is going to be aired on C SPAN right. uh, after it's recorded. <laughs> so you are going to be so famous, you're not going to be able to stand yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, and Kimberly, thank you uh, for doing your customary, just wonderful job. Um, I, I, I'll confess to you that, that Jacques Lamar and I were texting during this um, talk saying, Kimberly is so awesome. She does such a great <laughs> job. So um, thank you very My much. My pleasure. Really these, these talks it. have been great. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight. And one thing I did want to say to our two, um, our, our two guests, you know, so many times we're left with the idea that Black history begins slavery, that Black Americans don't have a past before slavery. And I really just appreciate both of you kind of turning that idea on its head. And it's so important that that message be out there um, as well. We did not begin as people, as slaves in America. So yes. thank you for that. What a great note to end on. Thank you so much. And and Amy Huffnagel, I think you're still in the audience. Thank you for um, co-hosting this event with us. It's great, part of a wonderful partnership that we look forward to continuing. And of course, with our friends at the Amistad Center as well. Thank you so much for having yeah. us on. And, and thank you, Kimberly, too. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Right. And thank you to our audience for your great Wait, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> your great questions um, and uh, for your donations and for your book purchases. It looks like a lot of you uh, took advantage of that and continue to do that. Um, and uh, just thank you again for a wonderful evening. We hope to see you soon and good luck with your tour. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.